Um, good morning. Yes, thank you, John. Um, thank you to everyone for joining uh, today's webinar. Um, again, on the importance of co-curricular activities for your personal, professional, um, and academic growth. Um, hopefully, we can move to our next slide. Excellent. So, just to give you some context um, and an introduction, really, to um, the program, uh, we have a one-hour dedicated slot. Um, that take place on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, and they are always between four and five, um, with a couple of exceptions um, to that rule that go on slightly longer um, because they may be off site. Uh, we have over 50 CCAs, um, so a large kind of variation um, of uh, activities for our students. Um, so there's always an opportunity for them to be busy, uh, for them to be learning new things. Um, and obviously to be socializing uh, and making new friends, um, which I think is really pertinent, especially for our boarders um, who may be living here for the first time uh, and coming over to London. Uh, and it is a really good way for students to kind of uh, connect. Um, they might only see a certain amount of students uh, with, this, with the subjects that they take, um, and they may not have that many opportunities um, to socialize outside of their, their kind of classmates. So by getting involved in, in CCAs, as we call them, um, for short, uh, it gives it gives those students opportunities to, to mingle and interact with lots of different students and also, also from different age groups as well. Um, so we kind of break them into societies, clubs, sports, music and art. Um, so we ask students to sign up for at least one CCA uh, because of the different courses and options that we offer students. Um, sometimes there, there's not a huge amount of time um, kind of for their free time um, outside of kind of their lessons and then their study time in the evenings if they're boarders um, and generally keeping up with homework and coursework, revision, um, socializing, being able to, you know, do some physical activity. So, you know, the, the time can be quite finite for them. Uh, and so we feel that it's appropriate to, to say that you do a minimum of one, but obviously there are students who are very keen and very enthusiastic to get, to get involved with as much as they can, um, and therefore they will do more. So the option is there for students to do more than one CCA, but the expectation is at least one, just to make sure that we know they are getting involved um, in college life. Moving on to the Duke of Edinburgh Award, that is something that we offer here and we are a, 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 an assessed centre, so that gives us um, a little bit more freedom in terms of um, us running the programme. Um, that is led by Jan Haynes and she is the uh, DOV manager. Um, and she's in charge of our expeditions uh, and helping our students go through their bronze, silver and gold. So all awards are on offer to students. Um, the DOV is definitely recognized by employers um, and also by universities. So it really is a great award to have um, on a student's CV um, and on their personal statement, um, which I know Gareth will talk more about kind of pathways into university um, and how CCAs can help in that way uh, shortly. Um, students will have to do a number of different um, kind of components with the Duke of Edinburgh, um, including skill, practical, um, some charity work, uh, and they have to do a lot of hours on that. Um, across the year in order to receive, as I said, bronze, silver and gold. As you can imagine, gold is the longer process um, that can take uh, two years and bronze is the shortest um, way of achieving uh, an award. Um, so we try to make sure our younger students are involved uh, in the bronze award where possible um, and obviously try to see them through to their gold um, for those that are very committed uh, to the program and to the award. Uh, but it is very recognized, as I said, uh, and it's great that we're able to offer that here um, at the college. Um, student voice. We do have surveys that go out um, a couple of times a year just to get some feedback from students to see if they are indeed enjoying the CCAs, if there is enough on offer for them, uh, and if the delivery um, is of quality, uh, because that is important and that is uh, something that I have to make sure is happening within my role um, as head of co-curricular. Um, 
you know, students will come and knock on my door um, and say, you know, would we be able to offer a, a, a CCA? It's not always possible. Um, sometimes logistics um, ca can be difficult, but where possible, we do try and offer um, what we can to our students um, and have certainly offered things that have come off the back of um, students' feedback. So I touched on earlier with the charity events uh, with regards to Duke of Edinburgh Award, but we do run charity events throughout the year. Um, we have a, a strong student council uh, and they have a team, um, a charity team, specifically looking um, at what we can do to, to fundraise for the school throughout the year. Um, so we've had fun runs, we've had bake sales, uh, we've had uh, staff student uh, football matches for a charity called Movember, which is a men's mental health um, uh, charity. Um, and we do a lot of work with Evelina Children's Hospital as well, um, which is very local to us just across the road um, at St. Thomas's. Um, and we do feel that that is important for students to give back. Um, and uh, we do think it helps with their own well-being because, you know, when you're not always thinking about yourself and you're thinking about others, I think um, a lot of kind of gratitude can come from that. So it is important um, that students are involved in charity events. Um, so in terms of the sign up process, uh, at the beginning of the year, once students are settled in the first week, we have a CCA fair. So all of our teaching staff gather in our atrium um, and they basically promote their CCA. It's an opportunity for students to speak one-to-one, -one, um, for them to go around with their friends in quite a relaxed manner um, and have conversations and see what they may be interested in. Um, and we try and showcase some of the CCAs where possible, uh, i.e. having uh, our DLD band perform. Uh, and in the past, we've had some students DJing, as you can see from her background to this uh, PowerPoint. Um, and it's a really fun, it's a really fun event. Um, and it really kind of drives that enthusiasm at the beginning of term for students to get involved. Um, they then kind of go away and they will have a taster, uh, a taster day between four and five that week or the following week, where again, they can pop in, they can actually try the activity uh, before officially signing up for it um, the following week. So there is a couple of weeks of prep leading up to um, them officially signing up because we do want students to be committed to these for at least a term. Um, so uh, we want them to make the right choices. Um, so we use ePraise uh, as a system. So that is how we, uh, we give points, we give demerits. Uh, students can have that on their phones. It has their timetables on there um, and it also has their activities. Uh, we take the register for each of our CCAs via ePraise. Um, and as I said, we can also give uh, points for excellent work in CCAs as well as class classwork. Um, and then I can download uh, various data and reports with regards to participation via ePraise um, based on the students' uh, attendance, participation, etc. So in kind of summary, as an introduction to my role, um, you know, this role came about a couple of years ago um, when we had our structure of the day change, which allowed, um, as I said at the in the very first point, uh, it allowed for a dedicated slot. Um, a couple of years ago, before this, uh, CCAs would take place after school, um, after five o'clock. Um, and that was quite a stretch for teachers um, and students. Um, and it was difficult to, to get as much of an uptake as we would like. Um, so with the structure of the day and slotting it into our school day between that four till five, um, it's really given an importance um, to, to co-curricular activities. Um, and the introduction of my role as head of co-curricular um, has, you know, shown uh, the school's commitment to CCAs, in my opinion, um, and has made it a, a lot more visible in the school. Um, so, yeah, really pleased um, with the fact that we were able to have a dedicated slot uh, and to really push the importance of CCAs to our students. Um, and my role is basically to make sure that it runs smoothly, successfully, that I listen to students, that I'm trying to put on as many opportunities as possible, um, that there is high quality across the CCAs, that we are uh, being involved in external competitions, um, that we are running sports teams, uh, supporting productions and music events, 
um, helping Jan, as I said, with the Duke of Edinburgh Award, um, and just being that kind of focal point um, for the co-curricular programme. So that's just a, a kind of a brief introdu introduction to CCAs, but hopefully gives you um, a, sl a slightly more context. Uh, we could probably have the next slide. Excellent. So um, I'm going to focus on the personal growth um, today uh, in, 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 in this webinar. Um, and Gareth will, will move on to uh, the professional uh, and academic side of things. So there's quite a lot of research that has been done probably over the last 10, 15 years um, with regards to kind of this growth mindset. So Carol Dweck talks about two mindsets, a fixed mindset and, and a growth mindset. And as you can imagine, fixed um, is basically saying that the abilities we have and the, the skill sets that we have are fixed. Uh, we can't change them. We're good at some things and we're not good at others. And there's no real point in trying because it's fixed and it's not going to change. Now, obviously, that is not something we want to encourage in our young people uh, and in our students here at DLD. Um, we are trying to create leaders for tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, we really want to feel that they can grow in their time at DLD. And that doesn't that doesn't just stop in the classroom that goes into um, after school uh, and their interests outside of their subjects. Uh, and so growth mindset is something we, re we really try and push um, in the co-curricular kind of program uh, and is a big reason why it is important. So growth mindset is encouraging um, uh, students to, to kind of empower them to achieve their full potential. Uh, we really want to try and do that. Um, Matthew Syed um, talks about kids uh, must be willing to fail if they want to succeed. So a couple of very simple examples of that are if we have a sports team and our students go and play a school and they lose, they're going to have some learning from that. They're going to take away some learning and hopefully they will practice, they will go away, they will train and they will go to their next game and they will try and put into practice some of the things that they've learned into the next game to hopefully be successful. And that kind of continues in a cycle of wins and losses. And obviously as adults, we know that, you know, when we're a little bit more experienced, we know we're not always going to win. We know we're going to have some struggles, but it's how we kind of overcome those struggles that shows who is truly successful. And we really want to instill that in our young people. Moving on to soft skills. Um, these are seen as very important to employers these days. So yes, of course, our grades are number one. Of course, we want our students to achieve the best they can um, in their A-levels, in their BTEC, in whatever courses they may take. But soft skills are really, really important um, in the modern world. Um, you know, there are huge companies, tech companies that are really looking to kind of hone in on those individuals who, you know, have a breadth of knowledge in their subject, but, um, but, but also have those soft skills. So Alison Horsmeyer talks about um, curiosity and having T-shaped individuals. So what's T-shaped individuals? So really it's looking at the vertical line um, as basically those individuals who have a deep um, uh, kind of expert deep expertise, sorry, um, in their field. And then the horizontal line across the T is looking at their broad sets of interests. So at interview stage, um, they're asking slightly different questions to kind of draw out what those interests may be. Because once we join a company, as we know, we may not just be siloed into one uh, into one area. We may go across the company and we want young people to be going into a working world prepared for that and curious um, to, to see where their interests may lie within that industry. So T-shaped individuals, I think, is a, is a really nice way of looking at things um, and, and a way that we would like to shape students um, with the amount of uh, co-curricular activities that they can get involved in uh, in their time at the school sharpening the saw. So what do we mean by that? Well, we're looking at kind of looking after ourselves uh, and, and young people looking after themselves and having those healthy habits, you know, just to be kind of really logistical about things. If um, a student is, you know, attending debating uh, or is in a drama production, they have to make sure that they're prepared. 
They have to make sure that, you know, they've learned their lines. They have to be there on time to be respectful to the other people in the production. Then once they're there and they're practicing, they need to kind of give their full self in order to have the best version, uh, so the best outcome um, on the night. So by doing that, um, by doing that, we have we have those healthy habits of, of time management, of looking after ourselves, of getting enough sleep. If we look at things like being part of a sports team, you know, by training after school, we feel that kind of nice tired where hopefully we're going home or in the boarding house, we're eating, we want to eat healthily to look after our bodies because, you know, we're in a sporting environment or we have a production coming up and we want to feel good about ourselves doing that. Um, so we go to bed on time. And then we have a healthy habit of waking up on time the next morning. So kind of really getting students to understand that they need to look after themselves and sharpen that saw um, in order to kind of be the best versions of themselves. Um, and honestly, in my experience and in my time uh, working at DLD and working with young people here, those who are truly committed to a co-curricular activity, I've rarely seen them not be a successful academic student that they are the students who do manage their time, who are respectful to others' others' times, whether that's the, the staff member taking the CCA or the students are, that are in the CCA as well, because they don't wanna let them down. So it really is important to, to make sure that students are looking not just within their subjects, but wider. And then last but not least, uh, for me on personal growth, we're looking at grit. We want to have these gritty students uh, is a phrase that Angela Duckworth looks at, um, who's a very famous psychologist uh, and has wrote several books on this subject. So she defines grit as sustained passion and perseverance long term. It's all well and good to sign up to something. I'm sure we've all done it. We sign up maybe to a gym class and we do it for a couple of weeks and then we stop. Um, we want students to persevere with things. We want them to sustain their passion. We want to see that they can do a term or two terms or even the whole school year committed to an activity. I think that looks great for students' CV. I think it gives them things to talk about. And I think it shows that if someone is willing to, to be passionate and, and persevere in something outside of their studies, I'm sure they're going to be likely to do that within their academic studies as well. So we are looking for those gritty students, you know, it can be a tough world um, once students leave uh, education and go into kind of the working world or whatever they want to pursue. And I think that grit, uh, that passion and perseverance will only hold them in good stead uh, moving forward um, uh, and for their general well-being as well. And, you know, we talk a lot about mental health and well-being, um, you know, here at DLD. And I think that... Um, there is a security in being part of something, uh, you know, whatever that may be within the co-curricular program, working with others. Um, and I know that Gareth is going to talk uh, a little bit more on soft skills um, in his uh, in his slides coming up as well. So that is really snappy. That is really uh, kind of a real kind of broad overview and summary. But um, I would really suggest that you do go away and look at some of these, um, so, so, some of the names on, on this slide. So the Carol Dwecks, Matthew Saeeds, uh, Angela Duckworth, Annie Brock, they, they've wrote some really, really great stuff on this subject. Um, and I think having conversations with, uh, with your, your sons and your daughters about these types of subjects uh, and, and, you know, kind of prepping them for the importance of co-curricular so that when they are here, um, they understand it straight away and can really commit to something um, because I believe they will only benefit. Um, so that's it from me. I will now pass you over to uh, Gareth Evans. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, goodbye. Um, thank you very much, Sean. Um, hello, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Gareth Evans, and I'm an assistant principal at DLD College. Um, obviously, Sean has just spoken to you about um, the uh, importance of CCAs from a, from a personal uh, growth perspective. Um, but um, one of the other things that we really need to get across to um, the students that uh, attend DLD College uh, is the importance of CCAs from a professional and academic perspective. Um, and I think a question that we, we're frequently um, 
uh, challenged with by students is what, what's in it for me, um, getting them to understand the value of uh, co-curricular activities. Um, and what we're really saying around that to them is that when they're applying for a job uh, or applying for university, uh, they need to have more than just their academic achievements. Yes, it's important that they come to us and they, uh, they, they really excel in their subjects, um, but they need to also show that they can stretch beyond their academic achievements. It's not just about what they've done in the classroom, it's about what they do beyond the classroom. Um, and so what myself and uh, many of my colleagues here will uh, be trying to demonstrate to our students is that co-curricular activities, as well as that personal growth, give them really tangible, transferable skills that will help them in the classroom, but will also help them outside of the LD when, when they go to university or into the world of work. Um, those are skills such as communication, uh, teamwork, organization, problem solving, time management, uh, and also for many of our students, it's a, a really good way to, to socialize and, and build, their, build their confidence. Um, but it's really important that they, they understand how much value that co-curricular activities can actually give to them as an individual. You know, our responsibility as educators is to, to stretch and develop our, uh, the young people that, that join us and, and get them to um, move outside of their comfort zone, try, try new things, experiment, develop, challenge themselves. And so um, from my perspective, I think co-curricular activities give students uh, really important life skills, um, but we're seeing clear evidence that it's also enhancing their, their academic skills as well. Um, within my role, I, uh, I work alongside the head of universities and also the head of, uh, head of careers. Um, and so what we try and do as a, as a team is ensure that students understand the link between co-curricular activities and those various different pathways that they, they might be taking. Um, so essentially, no matter what route that they are taking beyond DLD College, CCAs, co-curricular activities, will help them on this road. Um, so we are looking at the fact that CCI, CCAs will help to enhance uh, students' academic, uh, academic grades. Um, and on the next slide, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the CCAs that we have um, that, that will help them on that, on that journey. It's also important that no matter whether they are uh, going on to university or they're going into apprenticeship or straight into employment, um, it's important that they have been able to demonstrate a genuine love uh, of their specialist subject. And a really good way of, of doing that is joining a co-curricular activity that takes them beyond the curriculum uh, lets them explore the subject in a far uh, deeper and complex way than the constraints of the curriculum might at times allow them to. Um, it's also really important with a co-curricular activity that they'll have many, many more interesting things to, to talk about on their, on their personal statement when they're applying for university or on their cover letter when they're applying for, uh, for a job uh, or for an apprenticeship. Uh, essentially, what we try and uh, push on to our students is the fact that they need to stand out from the rest. And one of the ways that they can do that is by getting involved in a rich and diverse uh, co-curricular um, offering so that they're, they're able to have lots of different examples whereby they can demonstrate this. Um, and CCAs, we know uh, by engaging with uh, different, uh, different types of uh, um, learners, different uh, members of staff, uh, different forms of activities, they're going to be um, developing their communication skills, which is going to be important both when they go to interview, um, whether that's um, a university interview or an employment interview, um, but also their, their written uh, communication will be, will be enhanced as well. And no matter what pathway our learners go on to, they're going to uh, need to be able to communicate effectively, both from a written and verbal perspective. 
So um, I mentioned earlier some of the uh, the benefits of, of CCAs. Um, this gives you an idea of some of the different types of um, CCAs that we have, which are uh, focused on academic um, development and, and um, professional development. Um, so um, we have uh, academic uh, study clinics uh, within, within the college. So uh, that's an opportunity for students to have more individualized time with their with their teacher um, so they can go uh, over things that perhaps they didn't quite understand um, fully in the classroom uh, they can work on their coursework if they're doing a subject that's coursework based uh, and get more guidance and support from the member of staff that's running running that um, study clinic um, and it's also an opportunity to stretch and challenge themselves so um, really going uh, above and beyond uh, what the curriculum is asking for so that they can uh, understand and find ways of really hitting those band five uh, A-star uh, responses. Um, we also have academic societies, which um, are an opportunity to go uh, beyond the curriculum for, for, our, for our students. Um, again, those, are, um, those academic societies give our students um, uh, possibilities to, to show a genuine love of the subject, um, to, to kind of stretch and challenge their, their knowledge beyond the confines of the, uh, the curriculum. Um, we also um, have students that enter into Olympiads, so um, that's around uh, science and, uh, and mathematics, um, and we, we have a really good success rate uh, with, those, with those Olympiads, and again, fantastic way to stand out on um, stand out on paper if if you've uh, uh, entered and won um, an external uh, external competition um, our arts uh, department for example uh, often uh, win uh, ISA awards um, which is an external competition that we uh, uh, that we take part in um, we talked I talked earlier about uh, the development of uh, verbal communication um, and our debating and public speaking um, uh, CCAs are, are a really good opportunity to, uh, to allow our students to do that. Um, and again, within that, we, um, we enter them into competitions. So we have internal competitions within our house system, um, but also uh, we enter students um, into competitions to compete against other, other schools. Um, and, you know, again, that's fantastic way to to really kind of take them outside of their their comfort zone um, but also give them tangible um, employment experience because um, that, that kind of debating and and competition with uh, with uh, uh, other individuals will be will, are really important skills that, um, that they that they will require um, and we also uh, try and get our students involved in uh, work experience opportunities so uh, we've got um, a young reporters uh, CC game so they're, they're actually working um, uh, on a, um, a with, with an external organization um, and getting uh, experience of being uh, being journalist and, and writing and publishing um, work I wanted to just um, kind of finish on touching on what additional support we have beyond uh, co-curricular activities, because I think co-curricular activities is, is one uh, aspect of support that we, that we have. Um, but our role uh, as educators is helping our students understand uh, the importance of CCAs on those um, different areas, personal growth, uh, professional and academic um, uh, growth. Um, so we have a number of uh, um, key um, staff members within within the school that will uh, work with our students, help them to understand um, the types of co-curricular activities they should be doing, rationalizing with them why uh, those will be the most effective to help them get to uh, the next stage of their life beyond DLD. Um, so um, one of the one of the most important functions I think is the, um, the house system that we have. Um, and I'm showing no favoritism to Metropolitan Sean by choosing, uh, choosing the Metropolitan emblem, but um, uh, the, the house system is, um, or the, the house master is someone that will meet with, uh, with the students in their, within their house 
as will the, the tutor. Uh, they're the ones that really get to know uh, the students, understand what their, their aspirations and dreams are, um, and they can help kind of uh, plug those students within their, within their house uh, into the right uh, types of co-curricular activities. And again, with, um, uh, with the head of careers, um, the head of careers uh, will um, be able to meet with students individually um, and give them more uh, bespoke guidance um, uh, around realizing their, their aspirations. Um, but they also, uh, they also organize other events such as a, a careers week. Um, they've uh, organized for uh, a different um, uh, apprenticeship schemes to come in and speak to the, speak to the students. Um, they can organize mock interviews. Um, and again, uh, head of university admissions is someone that uh, will work uh, alongside their team uh, with the students on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, working them through their, uh, their UCAS application. Um, and again, we'll be there to offer guidance in terms of how they can really stand out on, on paper. Um, so that brings me to the end of my section. Um, so we're going to open the floor up to questions to both Sean and I. Thank you, Gareth. And uh, thank you very much, Sean. Um, I think obviously some of the pre-registration questions that we had, you guys covered them really well. Uh, but if anyone does have any further questions, we have um, Gareth and Sean here for a few minutes. So please do post them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, one of the questions I think that, that sort of came up um, during the presentation, um, and I think it's probably for, for Sean first off, is you talked a little bit about, say, football, for example. But obviously, we have an amazing location right in the centre of London. But, but how do you manage getting students to these, to these venues and facilities? How does it work being located right in the centre of, of, of a big city? Yeah, <clears throat> very good question. Um, so we, it works two ways. In some ways, um, space is, is tricky is tricky to find um, in, in the central location. But at the same time, um, you know, we are very close to things. Um, so it kind of works both ways. We are no further than a 10 minute minibus uh, ride from any of our external locations. Um, we are a two minute walk from uh, a local park, Archbishop's Park, which has um, fantastic floodlit uh, AstroTurf uh, nine side football pitch, which we use uh, every Monday. We have um, in, in the same location, a uh, netball court. Um, there are some tennis courts there as well that sometimes we use in the summer, um, kind of weather dependent, obviously in the UK. Um, uh, we have uh, some sports centers, uh, some brand new sports centres that are only a couple of years old. Uh, we've used South Bank University's uh, sports centre uh, in the past. Um, so yeah, we do tend to, to get a minibus and they are short journeys, but it does make it more convenient uh, for students um, and for staff to, to get students there um, around the timings. So yeah, over, over the years, we've been able to build a programme where We've tried to get our facilities um, that we use externally as close as possible because um, we don't want uh, you know students' time eaten up with travel. Travel basically, um, as I mentioned, they have busy schedules as it is. Um, so we try and keep it as convenient um, as possible. Would we like more facilities and more space? Of course we would, but I think that's the, um, the kind of payoff between uh, maybe being at a boarding school in the countryside um, and being. Uh, at a fantastic central location uh, like we are in Westminster. Thanks, Sean. That's that's really useful, actually. And, and obviously, you know, we talk about being London being your classroom, but also London is your kind of CCA kind of venue as well, which is great to hear. Um, one, one of the questions we had sort of beforehand was just asking about if a student has a particular passion, and obviously we've got lots and lots of clubs and that's developing all the time, um, say for a particular sport that we don't currently offer, um, would we be able to help sort of facilitate them continuing that passion maybe outside of the school? How, 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 would, you, how would you kind of approach that sort of situation? Yeah, so it's definitely kind of under uh, my remit in my role to, to try and help facilitate students who maybe um, have a passion or an interest in a sport that uh, logistically is just very difficult for us to do kind of on site, i.e. something like horse riding. Um, 
we, uh, you know, we have uh, facilities that we know about um, that aren't, you know, too far away. Um, but it really does depend on the student uh, and and how willing they are to kind of commit to something where they may have to be on an overground uh, train for 30 minutes to get to, to somewhere a little bit further afield to, to enjoy that horse riding lesson. Um, we're happy to speak to clubs um, and kind of be that person in between uh, the, the student or the parents and the club. Um, but I would I would encourage students to do that Google search themselves before they come here to look at clubs in the area to, to do their own kind of research. The Internet is a fantastic tool um, to be able to to kind of help us find things quite easily. And I would encourage students to do that because I think for me, it shows the genuine interest they have uh, for it if they're doing their own kind of research. But I understand, especially if maybe English is a second language. Um, that maybe that communication between a club uh, and a student or parents uh, may be tricky uh, and we and I am happy to facilitate that um, kind of as and when needed. Thank you Sean and I think I think the other thing to say as well is if you are making an application to study with us and you have a particular passion do tell us about it um, if we know in advance we can obviously support that journey and help you um, to sort of find something that, that hopefully fits and, and you can continue that passion providing obviously it doesn't affect your academics uh, which is obviously the you know a, a big priority. Um, I think I've got one for for Gareth now um, just on the academic side of things we had a question about if a student maybe wants to go towards say something like medicine or, or law um, how would we structure the kind of the CCA journey to kind of assist them with that sort of a specific and, and I suppose generally you know for your university? Um, yeah so obviously um, a student that would like to, to study uh, medicine we have a uh, MedSoc um, uh, CCA so Med Medical Society and that's um, uh, really structured um, uh, around the um, kind of plugging plugging the skills uh, that they might not be acquiring um, within the curriculum content, um, but also helping them to understand um, the application process um, and and what what other um, what other things that they might need to bolster their their uh, application. So. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that on, on a medical application uh, or one of the skills that they really need is that they can work with um, different types of different types of um, people. Um, so we can organise for them to do work experience with um, a local children's charity that deals with children with severe disability, um, and that's um, you know that's giving them kind of a an idea of. Um, of a very different kind of scale of a uh, of individual that they might might need to um, might need to support in their in their career, but it's also something really tangible that they they can bring to life on their on their application. Um, I think you know around around law, um, our academic societies will be really important um, uh, for students to attend, and it will it will obviously depend on the type of law that they're they're hoping to to move into. So we would. Um, probably at house level, actually, be having those those discussions to to get a, a clearer picture, and even at interview stage, these are uh, discussions that that come up so that we can start to pre-plan before the student joins us. Um, I also think things like debating and and law, uh, sorry, debating and um, uh, uh, um, and public speaking are uh, definitely uh, vital skills or CCAs that the students can uh, should be getting involved with. Uh, just to just to add on to that, I would say that um, this year we've been fortunate enough to have one of our staff members run um, Law Society uh, as well. Um, that is a new CCA for us um, and it's kind of growing. So it's in the early stages now, but kind of want to kind of keep pushing that, um, uh, you know, each year and keep developing that um, with George, one of our teachers. So Law Society does exist. Um, it's at a small scale at the moment and it's one that we would probably like to to build um, over time. Um, slightly separate from uh, that as well, but just to mention, obviously the EPQ, which is um, an extended project that students can do, and that can be timetabled uh, into their in, into kind of their free periods, um, and they have someone, uh, a staff member, that will guide them through that process. Um, and again, that looks really good 
um, on any kind of personal statement um, to show that they've gone above and beyond um, their, their studies uh, to focus on something that is put together in more of a university style based um, research project. So uh, from an academic point of view, uh, students having a strong EPQ um, under their belt is is very uh, is very handy as well. And um, the other thing just to, to add, uh, obviously touched on the university admissions tutor role. Um, uh, students will have a timetable slot with their university admissions tutor uh, every every week. So that's the one of the four to five slots where they're not doing a co-curricular activity. Um, and that, again, is a really good opportunity for uh, an individual student to speak to uh, a member of staff uh, and get, get guidance around um, around those, those more specialist types of applications. Brilliant. Thank you to you both. Um, I think we're going to hopefully wrap up um, with the last question, but please do post anything. And obviously, when we contact you afterwards, uh, if you have any questions that pop into your head, uh, do respond um, and we'd be happy to kind of put those to Sean or to Gareth or to, to get that question for you after the event. Um, we had a question just about how clubs would work for our younger students. Obviously, we have our year nine program, a uh, fantastic program, which is launching in September. But how would um, the CCA program kind of um, work for a year nine student in terms of the load uh, there? Yeah, I think... Um... Obviously, from uh, Gareth may have a, an academic kind of um, viewpoint on it, but I don't I don't necessarily see a huge difference um, with how CCAs will run for our year nines compared to uh, compared to, to our other year groups. Um, most of our CCAs are mixed um, age group where appropriate. Obviously, in some cases, that's that's not the case. Um, but uh, and I and and as I said earlier about kind of socialising. Uh, and learning from other students, it is quite nice if you're in debating to have a year 11 student or a year 10 student learning from a year 13 student who may have debated for the last three years at DLD and has been to external competitions. Um, and it's just guiding students through that. They may not be strong enough in year nine or 10 to go off to an external competition, or they may not be confident enough. But with practice, as we spoke about grit and perseverance over time, um, the CCA leader of, of, of the debating society may put them into to, to a competition to, to allow them to, to, to have that experience or a public speaking competition um, or an ISA competition, you know. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, where sometimes it wouldn't be appropriate is if we are playing a senior sports fixture against maybe 17, 18 year olds. Um, we wouldn't obviously be bringing a year nine into, into that environment. But depending on um, obviously the numbers in year nine, come September, um, we can kind of assess what would be most appropriate for them. So to be honest, I think that's still a work in progress for September um, as to how specific we need to be with the year nines. But in most cases, um, we would look for them to be involved with, with the other year groups uh, across the programme. Yeah, I, I, I would agree um, with Sean there. You know, one of uh, inclusion is a uh, is is really important at, at DLD, and you know we want uh, all of our students to to feel that they have access to um, a wide range of co-curricular activities. Obviously, there may be some specific instances where where that's not appropriate, but we would uh, we would uh, we would manage that. I also think that um, there'd be positive role modelling from for our younger learners from some of the older students. So. As Sean says, being involved in uh, debating, they can learn from some of our our older students. So I think that's you know a really good opportunity for growth and development for, for some of our younger learners. Um, the other thing, just to point out, with the Year Nine curriculum, which is is a really exciting curriculum, um, they have a project based um, uh, section to the course, um, and that will involve uh, on a Friday um, Fridays going going outside of the DLD. Uh, on on occasion and then working on on specific projects and I think uh, that's a really good kind of co-curricular extension um, that the year nines will will be able to uh, to develop. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Gareth. Thank you, Sean. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, uh, so thank you very much. I'll let you guys say goodbye and we'll sign off for the day. Thank you very much. 
Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.